Chapter 7 The two raced into the gloom of the bridge. The crew sat tensely at the controls while a few officers raced from one station to another. Outside the viewport, they could see vapour trails of proton torpedoes and showers of explosives. The ship shook with every nearby blast. It was an ambush. Crane must have known where they would appear. Captain Ampfdeck stood, his hands gripping the arms of his control chair. Where is the ship? he screamed. Where is the ship? It dived below us, Captain, one of the crew members shouted. Full speed ahead. Full speed. No, left engine's full. Captain Ampfdeck shouted, his voice on the edge of hysteria. Where is the ship now? The ship lurched to one side as the crew struggled to reconcile the captain's contradictory orders. This lurch was followed by another blast that sent everyone on the bridge staggering. Crane is off to our port, sir, one of the crew members said. We've taken a blow to the fuel driver. What is he doing? Captain Amphdeck shouted. Doesn't he know who we are? Yes, Captain. We informed the ship that we were a colicoid ship with a Jedi observation team aboard, as per your instructions, the crew member added pointedly. Portside deflector shield is down, another crew member shouted. What? the captain asked, scuffling over to stare at the readout. How could that be? We didn't get it fully operational in time. Idiot! Captain Amphdeck nearly fell over as another blast shook the ship. It's an ambush. They must have reset the coordinates of our nav computer. Anakin and Obi-Wan stared out the viewport as the pirate ship shot into view. It was smaller than the colicoid transport, but highly manoeuvrable. By the look of the orbital gun platforms and laser cannons, they were also vastly outgunned. Because of his acute connection to the Force, Anakin knew his ability to read situations was far-ranging. He didn't need the Force now to tell him that with a failing ship and a panicked captain, they were in trouble. If they couldn't outmaneuver Crane or outrun him, what options were left? He looked at his master. When it came to strategic thinking, he depended on Obi-Wan. His master could not only process all aspects of difficult situations... He could come up with several strategies and hone in on the best one, all within seconds. Our only hope is to get a small transport off this ship and infiltrate Crane's ship, Obi-Wan said. If we can get aboard, we could disable the weapon system. What's that? The colicoid captain turned his long head. What did you say? Will you authorise release of one of your transports to us? Obi-Wan asked. What for? To infiltrate Crane's ship, Obi-Wan repeated. It's the only way we'll escape destruction or capture. Do what you want. I don't care. Captain Amphdeck clutched the arms of his chair as the ship lurched from another blow. Just do something. We'll need you to create a diversion. Fine. Without another word, Obi-Wan turned and ran off the bridge. Anakin followed, his heart racing. He admired how his master had sized up the situation and chosen a course of action within seconds. It was a daring move, but it could be their only hope. They reached the cargo bay doors, where a number of small transports sat. They were used to ferry passengers or cargo to and from the surface, while the large ship orbited a planet. Obi-Wan stopped and turned to Anakin. Choose. Gratified by his master's trust, Anakin turned to the ships. He surveyed them with a pilot's eye, but also drew in the force to help with the decision. He needed to go on instinct now. He trusted that it would tell him the right ship to choose. The G-Class shuttle, he said to Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan hesitated. The lighter could be faster. Anakin grinned. Not the way I fly. Obi-Wan nodded. 
They ran toward the free winged shuttle. Anakin activated the hatch and swung himself up into the cockpit. Obi-Wan followed. Quickly, Anakin familiarised himself with the controls. There wasn't a ship made that he couldn't fly. He contacted the crew who operated the bay doors and quickly instructed them that they had Captain Amphdeck's permission to leave. After a moment, the doors opened slightly and Anakin activated the two lower wings, which lifted into flight mode. They blasted off into space. There, Obi-Wan said, after only a few seconds. If you can keep near his exhaust, I think our ship is small enough to escape detection. Not to mention that Crane has other things on his mind. The Colicoid had kept his promise to create a diversion, flying erratically and letting off enough fire to keep Crane occupied. And what should I do then? Anakin asked. I'm open to suggestions, Obi-Wan answered. But Anakin's mind was already working as soon as Obi-Wan said exhaust. If they could hug the rear of the pirate ship, they might be able to slip into the exhaust system. The steam would overheat the craft. But if Anakin could push the ship fast enough, they might be able to make it into the interior. Quickly, he described his plan to Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan nodded. It's possible, but the exhaust tunnels narrow as they travel inside the ship. We could be trapped. That's why this shuttle will come in handy, Anakin said. I can retract the wings by degrees and use the third wing to fly. Obi-Wan frowned. That will give you less control. Anakin nodded. I know. And the heat will be intense in that shaft. The ship could overheat. Not if I speed. Anakin knew what Obi-Wan was thinking. He would have to pilot the ship fast enough to escape overheating, yet not so fast that he'd lose his manoeuvrability. I think I can manage it. He would have to pilot the ship fast enough to escape overheating, yet not so fast that he'd lose his manoeuvrability. I think I can manage it. You think? I know. Fine, let's do it. Crane's ship had not spotted them, and Anakin was able to precisely mirror the pirate ship's quick attack manoeuvres. By hugging Crane's stern, he was able to escape detection. He anticipated which way the ship would move as it attacked again and again at the vulnerable parts of the colicoid ship. He followed the ship like a shadow, all the time easing closer to the great exhaust valve at the stern. The exhaust valve contained a huge whirring propeller. Anakin hung in the air, his fingers on the controls, timing the propeller's turn. Obi-Wan remained silent allowing Anakin to gather his concentration. The tiniest miscalculation could send them into the twirling blades. Anakin knew the seconds were ticking away, and he appreciated Obi-Wan's silence. He waited until the Force gathered and united with his instincts and perceptions. He fixed his gaze on the spinning blades. They seemed to slow with the level of his concentration. As soon as he felt sure that he had fully absorbed the rhythm, he pushed the engines and felt the craft zoom toward the exhaust port. He flipped the shuttle sideways to slip through the blades. The small craft shuddered from the wind created by the powerful blades, but it zoomed through an opening with only centimetres to spare. Anakin kept his hands tight on the controls. Suddenly, there was a blast of energy from the powerful exhaust. He was being pushed back into the blades again. Hold on, he shouted. He pushed the throttle forward, giving it all he had. A simple touch of the blade would send the ship spiralling out of control. The engines kicked in. Anakin had to struggle to keep the ship steady. They were speeding now. Too fast. Within seconds, he saw that Obi-Wan had been correct. The shaft was narrowing. Soon, there were only a few metres between the wings and the sides of the tunnel. Anakin quickly activated the wing controls, so that the two side wings folded up toward the body of the ship. 
He felt the controls jump in his hands, but he held the ship firmly, slowing it down. I see light ahead, Obi-Wan murmured. Although Anakin knew there would be no censure in his master's voice, he knew he'd cut it too close this time. Obi-Wan continued, I'm betting we'll come out near the turbine in the power core. I hope there's room to land. So did Anakin. The ship was now bumping with the fierce air currents, and he bent his wheel toward gentling it like a skittish banfer. Between the wing instability and the power of the exhaust, the ship was close to losing control. But it wouldn't. He wouldn't allow it. He trusted in the ship's ability to take them where they needed to go. He powered down the engine slightly as the shaft narrowed. They burst through the opening into the central power core. Anakin quickly avoided the giant turbines that sent energy blasts and steam down the shaft. If he landed directly in front of the exhaust shaft and turned off the engines, a good blast from the exhaust could send the ship back into the blades. Instead, he eased the shuttlecraft down in the tiny space nearby. It was still close to the shaft, but the exhaust was not powerful enough to move the ship. He set the landing gear to lock. Obi-Wan scans the area. Let's make for that catwalk. It will most likely lead to some sort of tech station. The ship is in attack mode, so the crew will be too busy to notice us. Let's hope so, anyway. Anakin opened the hatch, and they climbed down from the ship. Immediately, they were hit with a staggering blast of heat. Ignoring it, they ran lightly toward the catwalk. Accessing the force, they leaped over the railing high above. Then they ran down the twisting metal walk past the giant generators. The catwalk led to a small door that had a small wheel that served as a manual opening device. Obi-Wan quickly twisted the wheel, one full revolution. His hand on his lightsaber hilt, he went through the door. They were in a tech readout room for the power core. It was empty. These readouts were backups, used only for emergencies. Obi-Wan proceeded to another door and accessed it. This time they found themselves in a narrow, grimy hallway. We have to search for the weapons control tech center, Obi-Wan murmured. It must be nearby. We can't expect it to be empty, however. On the contrary. Anakin followed Obi-Wan down the hallway. Moving fast, they came to the end of the corridor. A window in the wide double door showed them the interior of a tech center. Obi-Wan motioned to Anakin to stay on one side of the door. He peered through the window. Everyone was too busy to notice him. The centre was staffed by tech droids. Since the weaponry was controlled at the bridge, the droids were merely monitoring the different systems. The droids are equipped with arm and chest blasters, he told Anakin. No doubt they are programmed to kill anyone who interferes with the control panels. We'll only have a few seconds before they register our presence as threatening. There are 14 of them. Anakin nodded. He withdrew his lightsaber. Ready. Obi-Wan opened the door and walked into the room. Anakin at his heels. Inspection, he announced. A droid who was patrolling the others turned its rotating head. Authorization. Authorization? Obi-Wan's lightsaber glowed. Here. He sprang forward, slicing toward the control panel. At the same time, Anakin moved to the left to take out the patrolling droid. He neatly sliced the head off the droid, which wobbled, arms waving, until he buried his lightsaber in its chest control panel. He felt a surge of satisfaction from the power of his new lightsaber. He wasn't in training mode anymore. The other droids were quick. They swiveled in their stools and rose as one, blaster fire pinging from their chests and arms. The blaster fire sang in Anakin's ears, random and close. 
The room was small and bare. There wasn't space to evade fire, and nowhere to hide. The two Jedi had to rely on their lightsabers only. Anakin kept his lightsaber moving, trying to deflect fire as he moved forward. The perfect balance of the lightsaber helped his accuracy and speed. He kicked out with one leg, and sent a droid flying, then somersaulted toward another, cleaving off one blast to arm, and then slicing the droid in two. On his downswing, he demolished the droid on the floor for good. Turning, he went for the third droid. Obi-Wan was a blur. He whirled, dived, leaped, and kicked, his lightsaber constantly moving. He held out a hand and the force blasted a droid against the wall. Within seconds, he had demolished seven droids and turned to help Anakin reduce the last droid to a smoking heap on the floor. Now for the weapon system, he said. Do you know how to disable it? Anakin asked. Obi-Wan grinned. Sure, I'll use a trick Qui-Gon taught me. He raised his lightsaber overhead and then slashed down onto the control panel. Smoke rose and metal sizzled. He aimed a second blow, then a third. Soon, the control panel was completely demolished. That should do it. Let's go. Anakin hurried after Obi-Wan. He knew they had only seconds before more droids arrived. Obi-Wan started down the long hallway, back toward the power core. Anakin suddenly halted. It didn't feel right to him to leave the ship. Crane was here, within their grasp. They had a chance to annihilate a vicious slave trader who had imprisoned thousands and was responsible for the deaths of countless innocent beings. How could they leave? At the end of the corridor, Obi-Wan sensed that Anakin was not behind him. He turned. What is it? I can't leave. Anakin shook his head firmly. We aren't finished. We have to destroy Crane. That is not our mission, Anakin. Grimly, Anakin turned away. It's mine. He turned in the opposite direction from Obi-Wan and began to run.